third of the workshop lectures. Um, and today we're going to look at um, learning through play and we will do a few things. We will look at the white paper, the Lego white paper, which is um, a link in the um, Canvas um, page for this particular workshop. Um, and uh, we'll reference, uh, we'll go through some of the references to play that that uh, white paper um, contains. That whole paper, which was um, produced by the Lego Foundation by um, scholars in the field of play and early learning, um, uh, focuses um, fully on play and the values of play within education and young children's lives particularly. Um, it's a really useful white paper um, because it has a kind of STEAM emphasis and that's what we're also going to concentrate on today. So uh, we're going to look through some of the um, statements in the um, Lego white paper and then we will also look at the two curriculum framework documents that are um, relevant to us in this um, in this course, which is the national early learning framework and the state early learning framework. Um, and again, we will look at some of the references to play and then I'll conclude by um, thinking about play in relation to STEAM and we'll kind of go through some kind of provocations. And the idea with this lecture is that you kind of watch this, you um, perhaps then go and look at these resources um, and read them more fully and also bear them in mind as you start to frame your ideas around children's uh, STEAM learning and how particularly uh, for young children, STEAM learning, if you remember STEAM stands for science, technology, engineering, the arts and maths, how learning in those uh, fields is really enhanced by play-based uh, by play-based teaching, play-based learning and activity. So the, uh, the ways in which um, we will look at early learning and STEAM over the next few workshops will have various different emphases and the emphasis for today is on uh, learning through play. So let's have a look at the next um, slide. So we're going to think about why play is important um, and I'm going to go through each of these um, points um, and expand on them a little bit in terms of um, why why you might see this term play-based learning or play-based pedagogies so prevalently in early childhood. I'm aware that you have probably had some kind of um, content already with your previous courses on play in early learning um, and so if you have had that experience or you've been reading um, significantly in the field, then this will enhance those um, uh, existing um, thoughts and ideas and, and learning that, that you've engaged with. And again, I would just remind you that what we're thinking about here, the con kind of contextual framing around uh, play in this particular lecture, is uh, play in relation to STEAM learning. There's lots of um, there's lots of great um, scholarly work into the you know the um, the benefits of play for young children, and that tends to focus on different different types of things. So it's complementary. Those those um, scholarship sources are complementary to what we're going to talk about today. So why play is important. So um, some of these statements um, are, you know, probably very familiar to you um, and you may have read them um, in various documents and various academic papers. So uh, if you have some existing kind of um, ideas, um, then that's great. Think about what you've already learned um, and how you might expand on those um, current understandings in terms of uh, kind of translating or transferring that knowledge into a STEAM context. So why play is important for children in their early years? 
it's it's a it's a mode of investigation really that helps children to become creative engaged and lifelong learners so it's this notion of uh healthy curiosity um that that makes all of us um not just humans uh there are many other creatures on this planet that um play um and there's uh there's a lot of scientific research into the play habits of different um creatures um uh, on on this planet so uh, the motivations for play don't really change across the species if you like so um, in terms of what it brings for us as humans um, it helps us to become creative engaged and lifelong learners so let's think about this notion of creativity um, we we it, it's hard to become creative by doing nothing or actually not uh, forming your own opinions or kind of experimenting with your own ideas or um, you know kind of uh, formulating kind of hypotheses um, and questions about the world so play is a kind of major major kind of aspect of that development it's a major uh, kind of mode of investigation or a mode of activity that allows that creative kind of uh, creative experimentation um, creative speculation and all those kinds of things to to take place so um, creativity is, is something that is brought about perhaps more effectively through um, play play is an active thing it is an active um it's not necessarily a physical activity playing can be um something that is uh kind of um, cerebral um it can be imaginative um it so it can be kind of taking place within the mind if you like so it doesn't have to be a physical thing but um what it does is it it connects us to things in the world, to the questions we have about the world, to the questions we have about um, quite specific things in the world. Um, and so play is a way in which um, we can test out those interests and test out what we know of those, uh, of those ideas. When we see young children play, um, we see that they are also doing that perhaps in a more kind of foundational way as an example children will often play with um, character toys so that can be human character or animal character or monsters or dinosaurs or um, all kinds of things um, um, and through playing through this kind of um, role playing with toys uh, children start to kind of play with ideas about interpersonal skills, friendships, family uh, relationships, um, uh, learning to be friends with people as they encounter non-siblings. Um, so there's all these different things that children experiment uh, with through play in terms of their uh, developing sense of, um, of their engagement with the world. Sometimes if children are having, um, uh, not necessarily struggles, but if they're having certain experiences with friendships, they can be a little bit fraught when children first go to um, kindergarten, for example. They might have, it might be the first time they encounter children that are not their siblings um, and that are not kind of... Um, uh, not kind of living within the habits of home wherever you know they're, they're very familiar kind of rules and regulations and things like that and habits that that they live by in their family um, if children are engaged with others it's often a little bit um, of a mystery for children at first as to why these other children are slightly different or have different home experiences or different kind of ways of doing things different expectations and so on and so play helps children to engage in those developing friendships um, to, to kind of problem solve or to um, find solutions to things that they're a little bit unsure about. It also helps children in terms of their physical engagement um, use their bodies to find out about the world in kind of sensorial uh, and corporeal ways. So, for example, what is it like to climb a 
a rope wall or what is it like to swing down um, a rope or what is it like to go down a slide or so on? What is it like to first go on a scooter? What is it like to play in the sand pit with your friends or to jump on a trampoline or something? So uh, through play, children learn about what their bodies are capable of and how that feels for them, whether it's um, fun or challenging or all kinds of things. So play is important in terms of understanding how our bodies are and how they, how they work in those physical ways. And because play is generally enjoyable, um, it is it kind of sparks uh, a way of for all of us as adults to to learn through our lives. Um, we often learn through playing um, as we get older. If we want to learn a new skill, we might go and try um, try. Uh, a, a sample of something, you know, particularly those of us who might try new um, creative skills or physical skills or something like that. Um, we also like to play games still as adults. Uh, the popularity of app games is testament to that, um, you know, like, I don't know, Candy Crush or um, uh, Minecraft or something like that, or uh, uh, the the home-based um, gaming consoles and things like that, the popularity of those shows that as adults we continue to like to play. So it helps us to engage in learning and new skill building throughout our lives and it's, a, it's an interesting and fun way to, to do that. If we think about what's happening in the world right now, which is a lot, like an extraordinary amount, um, we know that young children are not immune to those things. Uh, we know that children are at home talking with their families. They may be exposed to um, social media posts. They may be exposed to the news. They may be exposed to adult conversations. Um, they may be seeing that uh, the impacts of what we're going through right now played out in their home life. You know through uh, their parents um, life situations for example um, children are not immune to the emotions they might not fully understand all the details but they are certainly very attuned they're very tuned in to the emotions of the people around them um, we know that within the early childhood sector um, that's also faced a lot of uncertainty and tension um, so we know that children will have this um, children will have this uh, they will have this sense of this stuff and so uh, play is important because um, play is an avenue by which they can kind of process some of these things and again I'll just remind uh, you about what I was saying before about kind of role play with toys or role play with their friends pretend play that kind of stuff um, and uh, often children will play uh, the scenarios that they are thinking about at home or uh, in their lives. And so play is really important to help children process uncertainty and change. It's very extreme at the moment, um, but um, at other times it's still there, uh, probably not as in extreme ways. And children continue to face uncertainty and constant change. Um, and, and play is a way for them to kind of process, to process that through different types of play activities. Um, play provides positive experiences and coping skills. Um, playing is um, independent. So playing is independent and it's spontaneous. So obviously the uh, tactics that are taking place, the kind of intellectual, um, developmental kinds of skills that are being pulled upon very quickly um, means that children are um, engaging in coping skills. They're making judgments very quickly. They're making kind of action-based research judgments, if you like. Um, but because it's couched in a positive experience, um, children are doing all these things whilst they're having fun. Um, and the reason why play is identified um, as different to learning, so uh, school-based learning, is because it's a choice-based thing. So children can kind of be motivated through choices 
to do things that um, th that they feel they're interested in. Sometimes it's not about being comfortable, but they are willing to take a punt or to take a risk or something like that because it's they're having fun and it's uh, it engages the brain um, in certain types of ways. Um, it kind of uh, gives them an endorphin um, uh, rush, if you like, um, and that pr helps them cope with the different experiences they are having. And it's it's fun when it's when it's a choice based thing to have a little bit of risk or some excitement or uncertainty or um, when children play boo, for example, it's like the you know the the kind of surprise. Um, or hide and seek or to jump out on their friends or something is kind of a bit scary but also a lot of fun because it's it's couched within that very fun kind of um, context so it builds that's why in early childhood learning through play is really favored because children can learn about quite big ideas and quite kind of really complex particularly in the social the social sense um, and the interpersonal sense through play because it is couched in these very positive experiences but actually what they're learning about are kind of really substantial life skills. We know that as humans we have this incredible intellectual and physical capacity so we have these nascent skills that we are born with um, and despite our diversity as humans um, you know uh, through our physical capabilities and our intellectual capabilities we are all built with these nascent skills um, they are kind of in there um, and as we play they are kind of expanded upon and so um, rather than being something that is given or or loaded onto the child uh, so for example more akin to school-based learning which is we are now going to do this task and we're going to teach the children this which is developed by the teacher play is is kind of um if you think of it blossoming like um if you put uh let's say it's a bit like when you um, put crystal salt in water and it builds and builds a bigger and bigger crystal it's that kind of thing so it's kind of extending on what is already there it's it's a kind of building on top of the, the structure that is already there and so uh, play is a kind of building um, based on capacity it's based on choice so once you start to kind of theorize play like that you can see how useful it is and how vital it is for very young children um, because very young children are emotionally immature um, and so it, it's it would be very difficult to kind of have a top-down approach to telling them um, telling them what to do and giving them things that are not inspired by their interests that would be very stressful for young children because of their um, their intel uh, emotional not intellectual their emotional immaturity because they are growing they're so young and so uh, it's a building on the motivations for them to want to do things and so yes play is, is a very uh, central concept within early childhood education because of that we know that play through all the reasons I'm naming encourages experimentation a little bit of bravery risk-taking but this is a kind of positive thing it's not it's not a kind of risk taking that we would worry about it's about children understanding what what they are prepared to do that they what they are kind of interested to push themselves to do and of course um, in uh, the regulations in early childhood provision we have a wider sense of what at what point that boundary line becomes unsafe um, or at what point that boundary line is is beyond what the child should be experimenting with so we we provide the kind of wider parameters but within those parameters there is freedom for the child to experiment in ways that are not going to um, hurt them uh, and put them at um, the bad kind of risk so when we think about positive risk taking it's what we're talking about here is not putting ourselves in danger it's more that we take a risk in terms of 
maybe not knowing what the end result will be or maybe not knowing about whether this will work it's a kind of it's that kind of risk it's a it's a risk in terms of um experimenting and wandering into an unknown under unknown territory and i think that's why when children use imaginative play or role play it's a way for them to kind of transport that risk taking onto onto a, an, a, another another being so um working with two um character toys for example to figure out play, uh, friendships or relationships is a way to kind of have that risky play without it being um attributed to to themselves or their own lives uh, it's it's why children like to dress up and pretend it's why children like puppets it's why children like um uh, character toys um and then kind of placing themselves into these alternate scenarios. Um, and, uh, and children are very, they kind of figure out very early on that this is a good way to test something without it actually relating to them. We know that physical play strengthens whole body learning and, and also their coordination capacities. We know that uh, creative play um, also um, enhances uh, gross and fine motor skills and core strength and all those kinds of things so um, it also uh, enhances the body mind link so for example your uh, your hand-eye coordination for example it's really good for language development it's good for um, children's um, uh, numeric understanding um, their environmental understanding, their kind of philosophic understanding. It, it just brings about all these kind of um, these extra layers of, um, um, of learning. Um, and then the final one is, is actually key. Um, we tend to, uh, there has, over the last few years, there's developed a bad habit in early childhood education. Um, and also parenting, actually, um, which is to kind of reward, reward, reward for the tiniest thing. Um, but actually what that does is that instills, even with the best intentions by the adult, it instills this fear of failure in the child. And if a child is afraid to fail, they will not experiment. And so the thing is not to always reward the child for everything that they do that is right, but to actually say, I'm really proud of you for trying that and it's okay if it didn't work. Um, I think that's great. And, you know, be careful about how you talk to children about their efforts. So pay attention to the ways in which they are experimenting. Um, we need children to be brave. We need children to not be afraid of failing because uh, in a lifelong sense, that sets them up then to be brave thinkers and to take risks in terms of having a full uh, and interesting life because they're not afraid of life, you know. Um, so play is a really, it's, it's kind of casual. It's okay. They're having fun. Maybe something doesn't work. But that's okay. Um, it's it's through this kind of continuous trialing, through this process of interest and motivation, whereby failure takes place, um, and children understand it as a key part of of their learning. So, this is some of the um, things that I was just talked about are embedded in the Lego white paper, which is called Learning Through Play. And here is a, a great quote, I think, um, from that white paper, which says, learning through play happens through joyful, actively engaging, meaningful, iterative, and socially interactive experiences. Um, I really like this quote because it kind of summarizes all the different aspects of play that the learning through play white paper discusses at length. So as you are thinking about your um, wicked problem in your group, um, which 
each of those wicked problems are about young children's lives in various ways and their young children's lives in relation to their education. I think this is a really good um, quote for you to bear in mind and the white paper is a really good um, uh, article for you to bear in mind as you're going through your trials, as you're going through your experimentations and your own possible failures and thinking about this is a main motivation. This is what when we're thinking about addressing our wicked problem, are we moving towards this kind of experience for the children? It, are we are we remaining connected to this intention or is our idea moving away from that is our idea a top-down approach is it too deterministic um, is there too much at stake um, how do we maintain this quote as a, a core of of our ideas so have some have some ways of kind of um, having these kinds of statements um, available to you and keep reminding yourself to look at them and saying are we still connected to this aim in our ideas generation and our possible solution so I think this is a great it really lists the kind of different facets of play um, the type of play that should be in young children's lives okay so now we're going to move on to the um, to the framework documents, how is play dealt with? So the, the slides previously, the learning through play, the white paper, a white paper, if you don't know, is a government uh, commissioned pay, uh, article or study. Um, and it tends to um, engage a team of um, experts in the field and they, ask these experts to produce a kind of statement, uh, an analysis and statement on the situation of something. Um, and then that is used to inform um, government uh, policy um, and people like yourselves, um, educators like myself, uh, people at university and so on. Um, so the white paper has a certain frame of um, intention and of certain use. Now we're moved on to the kind of framework documents which inform the curriculum and accreditation and the standards, if you like, of what uh, provision is um, uh, the state of the provision for young children in Australia. You probably already know, and some of you may not know because some of you are uh, studying this course from different programs in the university. Um, but the national framework is like a curriculum document um, and it informs uh, the whole of the early childhood sector in Australia. The EYLF stands for the Early Years Learning Framework. It was commissioned some years ago now by the federal government and a whole team of experts wrote it together. And the experts represent people who are early childhood educators working in kindergartens and long daycare, um, some parents, some uh, academics like myself, um, some um, uh, early childhood teachers, um, parents, I think I named those already, but a whole range of people with different kinds of experience. And so um, they put their heads together some years ago and they uh, constructed this framework. The framework is deliberately vague. Um, it has very neutral sta statements and that's intentional. Um, it's so that any early childhood centre across Australia could pick up the document and write their contents, their learning contents, their programmes to these statements and they would apply. So the more specific the statements um, go, the, the, the less flexibility that gives to um, early childhood centres to construct their own, um, their own programmes of learning. This is also a framework that goes from not birth to five, but birth to eight. So it's based on developmental model of early childhood which suggests that children move from early childhood into um, child, later childhood at the age of eight. 
And so this represents that um, belief um, and it applies to children from birth to eight years. So it's also a transition document and it is available for teachers in those first couple of years of school to actually refer to as well as their curriculum documents. So those early childhood teachers in schools can use the framework as well. So this is the national one. And then in Australia, we have state and territory based frameworks that are specific to the needs of the children in that area. And so because we are in Melbourne, I will look at this one first and then we'll look at the Victorian framework. OK, so what does where does play appear in the EYLF? Um, it's quite central, as you would imagine. So it has a specific emphasis on play-based learning. It has a, a, its own section. It has its own um, very um, detailed explanation. Um, and it is a central kind of proposition, if you like, that informs some of the other um, achievements and the other kind of context for learning that are in the um, EYLF later on. So the EYLF cites, they, they cite something that's even more foundational, which is the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child. So the EYLF is national. What they're quoting here or citing here, what they take as their um, reference point is the international um, UN statement that, is, um, that ha was constructed some years ago now to protect children across the world. And so many curriculum documents across the world cite the UN Convention. Um, and the UN Convention is, um, if you haven't accessed it, it's a really good document to access. Um, and you can even buy it as a children's picture book. Um, there are uh, some years ago now, a series of um, illustrators um, visualized different rights of the child and produced a picture book. So at the core of the UN Convention is the recognition of children's right to play um, and be active participants. So they're not, they're not passive. Um, they have a place and they have an important place and they have a voice and they have rights through those um, things. And so they, the UN rights of the child is about the children's right to have say or um, active participation in their lives. Um, and so they have a kind of, um, they have active rights, if you like. And so the, the EYLF looks at how the UN Convention thinks about play and its role in those rights and asserting those rights. And what they see is that the rights of the child are that children have a right to play. Um, and so that for children to um, be uh, well uh, protected or have a, a good start in life and to have their needs met, if you like, is that they must have a right to play. When children don't have that right to play, they suffer. Um, and so the rights of the child must be based on the idea that children have a right to play. <laughs> and so the EYLF talks about that quite a bit through its framework. So it then refines that a little bit and looks at play as play-based learning. Um, and this is how they take up the notion of play. They look at play-based learning and how this is a context for learning through which children organise and make sense of their worlds as they engage actively with people, objects and representations. So what I've done there is I've kind of summarised the much longer description that is uh, in the framework. And the reason why they see play-based learning, the EYLF sees play-based learning as so important is connects to the, the, the points I talked about in the second slide for all of those reasons. Um, it, and they, they understand that children through play organise and make sense of, of this complex thing called the world. 
um, and that their daily interactions and their daily kind of experiences they process through play and through different kinds of play. Um, and the EYLF, what it does then is um, it doesn't just think about what the child is doing, it actually then thinks about what it needs, what the early childhood um, provision in Australia needs to provide so that children can do those things, right? So it sees that play provides a context for learning um, through, these, through these points, but therefore early childhood education needs to offer opportunities for those things to take place. It needs the things that children do while they're learning and the, ch and the spaces that they're learning in need to have opportunities for these things. So their expression of personality, how do the activities, how does the space, how does the equipment um, support this and enhance it? How does the early childhood learning um, context enhance curiosity and creativity what what needs to be um, what needs to be available to the child in terms of um, daily activities or special activities and learning events and um, they they need to help the child enhance their intellectual connections so so uh, the curiosity the kind of inquisitiveness of speculation that children do on an independent basis um how does that happen openly so that children can have some control over how that happens as they they're um participating in their early learning um how it builds into personal skills and then all of those things stimulate because they are um, diverse things that happen, they're not repetitive, they're expansive, there are different types of activities that encourage different types of behaviours um, and different uses of the body and mind, how those things collectively stimulate well-being. And so from the EYLF what we see here is that they, uh, the EYLF says that children's immersion in their play, <coughs> excuse me, illustrates how play enables them to simply enjoy being. So it's not about this serious kind of um, um, imparted um, uh, instruction to learn through certain ways. It's an invitation to participate um, and that to encourage and have the conditions, a rich conditions available, children will um, simply enjoy being okay so in, uh, this is the crux of our course here is is being a child and how that takes place in the early learning context so now we'll focus in from the national to the state and how play in the Victorian early years learning framework um, is mentioned so the Victorian um, framework is uh, slightly uh, differently structured to the national framework, but it has um, it also has lots of similarities. Um, and similarly, it kind of uh, it it um, surfaces or holds up the importance of play within um, a, a kind of overarching. Uh, intention or um, aim for for early childhood provision. Um, I'm just going to turn off my heating. It's getting a bit hot. <laughs> All right. So, in terms of the state-based um, provision, the Victorian um, early uh, framework looks at how play stimulates and integrates children's intellectual, physical, social and creative abilities. So we start to see similar kinds of statements, similar statements in terms of um, what children are see, uh, seen to benefit from, uh, sorry, how, to, how children are seen to benefit from when they have an active play-based um, uh, education. But what's interesting about the uh, Victorian one is how they start to um, perhaps 
investigate play, the concept of play, with a bit more detail. So they, they start to think about what types of play can take place. What's, what are the types of appropriate um, forms of play that can take place in the early years context? So they actually start to provide a bit more of a framework to educators about how educators can think about play. So it can be combined. The types of play, the kind of uh, the forms of play or the approaches to play can be combined. And um, so they can be combined between integrated, child directed, guided and adult led. And then they go on to explain what these um, what these each mean. So they say that adult led play activities are deliberate and planned but in response to the adult's knowledge of the child. So this is about a kind of um, uh, careful um, observation and careful listening skills on the part of the educator, knowing the interests of the children or starting to form some understandings of the interests of the children and what might push them a little bit further based on those um, uh, interests. So for example, what can often happen in early, an early childhood uh, learning place is that children get really interested in building forts or dens, you know. Um, and so that's a wonderful engineering based um, activity because how do you make um, a room, often with sheets and cushions and so on and bits of furniture, so that you can crawl inside and it stays like a room around you. So without it being an actually a designed tent or something, how could you make a den? And so um, the adult might see that this is becoming a bit of an interest with children. And so the adult led play activity is to respond to the knowledge of the children developing this interest and how to enhance that with um, the play activities. So it's not about the, the adult stepping in and going, right, we're going to build a den and we're going to do it this way and we're going to do it that way and this is how I'm going to tell you how to do it. But to actually kind of um, uh, provide a bit more um, in terms of materials or a little bit more guidance perhaps, but still allowing the children to do that kind of directed um, learning but the adult has led some of the extension of that beyond the children just working on their own um, levels of knowledge and capacity. Child-directed play we've talked a little bit about already. It's exploratory, investigative and experimental um, and is controlled by the child. So a good space to see this in action is at the sand pit um, or the water, the water tub play. Um, and where you actually get children that feel comfortable to be by to be by themselves or with others, and the adults are not actually right in there, uh, you'll see these the manipulation of these materials in really interesting ways, and what the children decide to do. Um, and so often it's in those types of spaces um, where you see child directed play. Um, that is very much, um, as is described here, this kind of exploratory, what happens if we pour water in the sand? What happens if we try and make the sand castle too high? Um, it's investigative and it's experimental um, and very much controlled by the child. And so, again, this is important form of play to have in their, um, in their daily um, learning experiences. And then guided play occurs when adults are involved in child-led play activities. So this is whereby the adult kind of maybe joins in um, and becomes um, part of that play experience. So you can see here that we've got that we've got these different um, quite honed understandings of what play is. And then the adult-led, child-directed and guided play 
can be combined or integrated into other types of um, bigger activities. So this is quite a, it has more detail than the EYLF. But as you remember, the EYLF is deliberately vague, so it is, it is stretchy enough to, to be applicable to all kinds of different um, play spaces. But in terms of the Victorian learning flame framework, they say that play is central to the concept of integrated teaching and learning. So that's a big kind of uh, nudge, if you like, or a hint to say we do not want our educators coming in and deciding independently of the children what is to take place. We understand that children need to have an active role in what takes place and therefore play is the central concept of that and also how that integrates into everything that takes place within the within the learning space. So let's move on to this notion of uh, deep learning through play and it's this aspect that I really want to think about in terms of us moving towards uh, play-based learning and, and STEAM. So um, what, this is what we want to try and kind of uh, work our way towards when we are um, interested in conveying certain types of concepts and skills um, to children that are very young. Um, and so play-based learning is crucial for this because, because of all the reasons um, I've just been discussing. Um, now, again, this is a really interesting... Um, I really like this image from the um, white paper because it really illustrates how um, without play-based learning you only get the tip of the iceberg. So when we're not learning through that play which we're very invested in individually ourselves, we tend to do what's called this surface learning. So we, we do what's required of us. Uh, and, you know, sometimes it's, you know, memorising the key facts and principles. And if we think about this in terms of shapes, this is the, um, obviously, the learning by young children of shapes and why shapes are different to each other and what makes a shape. So if you look at the top two, we've got a hexagon has six straight sides and six angles and a triangle has three straight sides and three angles and the sum of its angles is always 180 degrees. So they are simple facts that help to classify what shape is different to another and how we understand what we're looking at. So what you have here with the triangle is an equilateral triangle but we know that there are different types of triangles that don't look like that. Uh, but it's a way, once we learn this kind of basic principle of the triangle, we understand that if it has three sides and three, three straight sides and three angles that uh, collectively add up to 180 degrees, then it doesn't matter if it doesn't look like that, it's actually still a triangle. Um, that's very difficult to remember. However, if you have this kind of deep immersive learning through play, um, children get this wider sense of these shapes in context to uh, real life, if you like. And so if we look at the deeper learning aspect, what we have here are some examples of shapes in life that, that children can kind of engage with and be uh, introduced to and perhaps understand far better because it's, it's been because of the context through which, through which the learning has taken place. So if you think about this bridge design at the top here, if you make a triangle out of three sticks with hinges in the corners, it stays rigid. That's why triangles are used in bridges, cranes, houses and so on. Um, and so this is that's a really interesting way for children to investigate the strength of shapes and how things are constructed. And so this, you know, again, obviously a very um, clear connection to engineering and maths there. And then we've got like snowflakes are symmetrical hexagons. This shape reflects how the crystals water molecules are connected. 
if you think that's too hard for a young child to uh, understand, um, think again. <laughs> Children uh, through play, their capacity to understand things are very, it's extraordinary what they can take on when the conditions are right. So um, obviously that's quite, um, quite significant science learning um, and, uh, and also maths through geometry. Um, but it's delivered in such a way that, I mean, if you start to see images of um, snowflakes under a microscope, that's a really engaging kind of experience. And then uh, finally, the hexagon is a useful shape, for example, in beehives, and they use the least amount of wax to hold to most weight of honey. So again, these really real life kind of learning situations. And so deep learning through play, it prompts the idea of networked connections. Um, children can remember stuff through the stories that are being told or the experiences rather than how many sides has a hexagon got and what's the facet of the, you know, what's the common facet of a triangle. Very hard to remember and they're out of context. Um, and really that kind of memory stuff can, can come much later when we're trying to, you know, cram for exams and so on. Um, so it's not needed right now. And so what deep learning through play gives us is this real life learning of concepts and different capacities are engaged. It might be that children remember the walk to the bridge or they might remember looking at um, uh, some hun um, honeycomb in a plastic tub that somebody's brought in, for example. Um, and through that, children can connect through these personal motivations and interests and that's different the essential thing is it's different for each child so you might have a group of six children looking at the honeycomb what each child takes away from that is quite different but might be equally effective in helping them understand the concept of the shape of the hexagon so you're just providing this very rich kind of learning Again, I want you to think about these things as you are addressing your wicked problem, but also um, the position papers and your, you know, your other assignments, your your written, your know, background papers, and so on. Um, and so these are things to really think about in terms of how deep learning through play brings about these uh, the assistance of these quite difficult concepts. So if we think about play and STEAM, um, we can see how useful play-based pedagogies are. Now this photograph is one of my photos. Um, I did, I was involved with uh, the other adults that you can see in this photograph who are dancers. Um, and this was a project whereby these children were doing um, dance and uh, uh, kind of corporeal learning to um, think about bird migration um, and uh, the birds that migrated to their local area which was in Auckland in New Zealand and um, and how these uh, birds which are called godwits how they migrate to a specific place in Auckland in the bay each year and where they come from how long they stay the reasons why they're there and then why they go and so lots of scientific um, and environmental science details there. Um, but um, very difficult for them to remember all of that stuff. And so this, this, <coughs> this dance activity, which is very playful, very creative, which engaged them in their body, got them to think about this science project in very different ways. And so this was a very playful um, and arts rich um, way of learning about um, environmental sciences. So in STEAM, we need to, as you go into your, um, as you go into your wicked problem, as you are going through the readings, as you're thinking about STEAM um, in terms of the topic of this um, course, this will be the kind of um, the, um, con the curriculum contextual um, contents of this course. I want you to think and remember all the time about how important it is to embed these key concepts in activities. 
So play is great for play, of course it is. But actually what the uh, framework documents um, talk about as well as the white paper is how important play is for children to learn about key concepts. So it's not just about casual play, which is very important and should be in children's lives. It's about these other forms of play as well. In that kind of play, um, we want to encourage, when we're thinking about science, technology, engineering, the arts and maths, we want to encourage questions and speculations with young children. For example, if you have um, a nest, a bird's nest that you bring in, um, how might the children's questions um, formulate? For example, they might be astonished that a nest is made from twigs that are just bunched together and somehow they stay together. And so the questions and speculations might be, how does the bird know what to do? Why does it not fall apart? <laughs> you know, um, and how, how does the bird, you know, make the nest, so to speak? And so play, how do you, how do you kind of address some of these things through play? Um, and what kinds of activities, what kinds of learning experiences that are play-based really would help children to understand some of those key concepts and speculations. I've, these are some of the things that I've done with children. Um, we research together. <coughs> so I don't try and be the expert. And I actually make a big deal of saying, oh, I don't know that, I don't know the answer to that question. Oh, you're, you're really smart. I, I'm not sure. That's a really great experience for a young child to have um, because they, they kind of understand the expectations are for them to be the, um, the novice and the adult to be the expert. And I think it's really good for them to have that subverted and that encourages that that subversion encourages play. So don't don't try and think of things that position the adult as the expert all the time. Children have incredible curiosities and and ideas about the world um, that that should be listened to and should be a prompt for researching together. So um, research um, also the steam thinking from different cultures. So, you know, don't um, rely on um, white Western um, ideas. It can be very persuasive, particularly in science um, and maths. Um, it's kind of been um, colonized, it's, uh, you know, over the years, but it actually isn't. There is not one way of understanding science and maths. There are different counting systems, there are different kind of um, understandings of the planets, there are different understandings about the, the earth and why things grow and what benefits things. Um, most recently, we've seen that in place in the discussions around the Australian bushfires and how the centuries and well, millennia of practices of bush care that indigenous uh, communities have um, exercised has been ignored uh, by um, white colonial uh, interests and how actually um, that's not worked. Um, it's generating these terrible situations. Um, and there's now a lot of councils and, um, and a big call to actually um, say, we, we, need to, we need to learn the bush care practices that indigenous people have been practicing for so long. That's science learning. Um, it's, yeah, so, you know, research steam that you're going to impart through play from different cultures. Play and steam means using whole body learning. So um, not just kind of um, talking about things, not just showing a picture or a video, but actually um, 
to be in a in an early learning situation mm. how would you use body learning how what what would be the possibilities of working with young children as whole body as whole body learners we know that children are whole body learners they really need to move really need to move and so um how do you how do you think about that in terms of what is possible how do you make the most of that capacity children's willingness um it's much harder to do whole body learning with year tens for example because um the motivations are not quite the same <laughs> but uh four-year-olds or three-year-olds they can't wait to get up and move so you know how do you how do you make the most of that um that enthusiasm and willingness uh, and as I just showed you in the previous image, use creative activities, use the A in STEAM, use the arts because it's it's um, it's a huge motivator and it's a huge kind of important area of children's learning, um, especially so as children um, are so young. Um, children don't forget at this uh, birth to five range, uh, not literate. Um, they are developing their uh, oracy skills, their, uh, like the oral vocabularies. Their, um, it, it's unusual for a child to have great written skills at this, uh, in that um, age range. Um, and so you kind of have to use other modes. You have to. Um, and so uh, drama, art, movement, songs, all those kinds of things. I will tell you, um, of a, a great activity I saw and this is a really wonderful um, example that I saw many years ago when I was observing a student on their professional experience um, and they were teaching children about coinage in Australia, the coins that we use um, and of course you know schools have all the little plastic replica money and all this kind of stuff and you know there's lots of things that you can do with pretending to buy stuff and getting the change and so on. But this this teacher went a bit further than that. So they had all the, the, the play money, but then they brought out um, this um, these enormous coins with a um, like a hoop that the children put around their neck and they became the 50 cents or they became the 20 cent piece. And then he made this enormous kind of purse, like a giant um, fabric purse with an opening. And he got the children, he had like a gym mat behind it and the children had to jump into the purse um, and they had to figure out the change. Um, and I have never seen children be so enthusiastic about learning about money. <laughs> before or since so um you know there's think about play as a huge motivation a uh, huge motivator for for learning these um these concepts that are very important but are, are sometimes a little bit hard to convey so um in conclusion um ex explore the resources for today um don't um, don't ignore the texts actually on play-based learning. Um, and I want you to think through this mode of learning uh, as we go through the workshops and as you go through your various assignments. Um, and I would like that to be the motivating mode by which you address some of the um, assignments as a team and individually. Um, and as you problem solve and experiment and do all that stuff, and I want you to engage through that work um, through play. OK, so I don't want I don't want you not to do this kind of work either. So I would like you as a team, certainly as you're um, working out your wicked problems and how you address them, how you think of solutions. What playing are you going to do um, together as a team? to come up with your with your possible solutions. And so perhaps go back through these slides and think about how um, there could be a, like a checklist for you um, to trial different ideas and opportunities. OK, and thanks very much. And I will um, see you at the next lecture.